Over the course of making the cellar door, we've had the pleasure of travelling Australia, visiting all our country's beautiful wine regions. Many of those regions and the communities that surround them have been greatly affected by the bushfires, and Channel 31 would like to extend our support to those communities affected. If you have the capacity to donate, visit redcross.org.au or wildlifevictoria.org.au to support their ongoing relief efforts. Hi, I'm George and welcome to the show. A little later on today, we'll be joining Sally for a guided tour of the Hunter Valley region. But right now, I'm in the Riverland in South Australia at beautiful Banrock Station, home not only to some amazing wines, but a 900 hectare wetland. This is The Cellar Door. Paul, thank you so much for having us here at Banrock Station. Welcome. In the lovely Riverland area. And you are the chief winemaker here. Yes, since 2008, I've been the winemaker for Banrock Station. Mm -hmm. Love the role, love the job, and just come out of uh, the recent vintage. Yeah, which is an epic job, I would say. You've got quite the uh, vineyard here. Yeah, working very closely with the vineyard manager, Shiloh. Mm -hmm. um, very strong year, really ripe, bright warm weather, no rain, so great for growing grapes. Mm -hmm. And what sort of grapes do you grow here? So on the property we've got a huge number of varieties, but mainly Columbard, Semillon, Chardonnay in the whites, a little bit of Fiano, which is great fun, and in the reds, Shiraz, Cabernet, Merlot and Montepulciano. Mm. So those are a couple of Italian varietals in there, which is from your time over in Italy? Oh, I loved my experience in Italy yep. and Montepulciano and Sangiovese experience there, but the climate here suits Mediterranean varieties. So Fiano grows really well, mm -hmm. Montepulciano grows really well, and we've got um, Portuguese plantings of uh, Tintamale and Tintacayo and Tariga. And you use those to blend as well as uh, straight varietals? Yes, they're great varieties for sort of tawnies. Which is port. Yes. Which is no longer port. You can't say port unless it's from Portugal. Mm -hmm. But the Tariga is a fantastic spicy bright wine. Blends really well with Shiraz. And the Tintamole, Tintacayo, um, although they do make really good dry reds, we mainly use them in our um, tawny production. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favourite grape? Yeah, I like the Montepulciano because it's, I say sort of that sour cherry, ripe plum, goes really well with steak. Mm -hmm. I'm all about red meat. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in terms of the white, it's probably the Fiano because it's that creamy textural wine. It's a full bodied white wine. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've studied winemaking and obviously you work full time as a winemaker. When did wine first become a part of your life? I wouldn't have been until probably second year actually being a winemaker, an really? assistant winemaker, because I was just a beer drinker. <laughs> um, and now I don't drink any beer, so I've gone full circle. So what took you to winemaking if it, you were just kind of... I think my mum wanted discount wine. She wanted to get a good discount on Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. I, had a, I loved chemistry, really liked my chemistry teacher. She was great and she really supported my interest in winemaking. So yeah, work experience, studied winemaking, it took me forever to finish my degree because I just didn't enjoy being at uni. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, second year winemaking, probably that trip to Italy, fell in love with red wine, fell in love with Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. And now I guess my real favourite is Tawny. Sure. Tawny and Muscat are my, my passions, but it's only a small part of our portfolio. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, I love that the trip to Italy was sort of midway through your, the beginning of your career and that's what cemented it for you. Yeah.
So we are still on Banrock Station, but we are now in your arena, Tim. That's right. So this is the other part of Banrock Station that not everyone's aware of. So we've got 1,850 hectares of property with three quarters nearly set aside to manage for these conservation purposes. Incredible. And these are the wetlands. That's right. Not very wet at the moment though. No, no, but despite what it looks like, uh, part of being a healthy wetland is also having it dry for a period of time. Uh, it allows a chance for all these plants that we see growing around us to come up, mm -hmm. which couldn't grow unless the water was removed for a period of time. And it also allows the soil to crack and expose some oxygen down there. And, oh, sure. Yeah, it's all part of the healthy cycle. And you facilitate that wet and dry yourselves, don't you? Yeah, we do. So we're, we're fortunate that we are, are on the banks of the Murray River here mm -hmm. and have an inlet creek that's upstream of one of the main locks and an outlet structure downstream. So it's all gravity fed oh, great. and we can uh, adjust the amounts of water volumes that are coming through. Mm -hmm. And so once the water's come back in, this place will be teeming with... It's just <laughs> phenomenal. From the cellar door, it's just deafening with the sound of frogs calling. Oh, really? You come down here and you can see fish just about jumping out the water. Oh my God, amazing! And the bird life is phenomenal. Talking 5,000 plus birds in a single morning you can see when you come for a walk. 5,000? 5, 5,000. So the record's just under 5,500 in the morning, so in four hours, but um, yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot, it is a lot. But there's still life happening during this dry period? There definitely is, and you can see in some places along the edge of the boardwalk, there's little red gum saplings coming up. Oh. And even in this general area, you start to look around and you see big trees that have come up during one dry cycle, and then you see another group over here that are about the same height and size. So you start to see that there's this regenerative forest process happening during those dry cycles. It's like a little history. It is. So we call this the class of 2008 and then the class of 2012, oh, and we're <laughs> producing the class of 2019 as we speak. So, so you've got a very unique habitat here. Yes. Uh, and it's internationally recognised. That's correct. Such. So Australia is a signatory of the Ramsar Convention. And what's that? So it's an international protection on wetlands that have significant values at a global scale. And so this is one of the four sites in South Australia that's listed under that convention. South Australia has four sites? Just four sites, yeah. And to get on that listing, there's a number of criteria. For mm -hmm. us, we tick the box in terms of having threatened species, endangered species, that live on the property in some of our habitat. So that's the southern that's bell frog. That's the southern bell frog. And the regent parrot. Regent parrot. So these red gums that we're walking amongst at the moment, uh, as they get uh, mature, they'll have hollows that they require for breeding, <sighs> and the, the fruit that they produce will be one of their main food resources. Sure. Uh, so that's really important. And we have large patches of intact vegetation of a whole range of different ecosystems. You're quite experimental here in terms of the wines that you create. So you've got a few different uh, creations here. I'm intrigued by these. Yeah, the new spritzed fruit fusions. Or mm. um, well, Banrock, we would like to be leaders and innovators in not just um, wastewater management, our vineyards, but also our styles. So with the new spritzed range, they're 8% alcohol, uh, low sugar, low alcohol introductory wines. We're blending Sauvignon Blanc, with, in this one here, uh, the blood orange. Yeah, you've got, so it's, is it fruit juice that you? Yeah, like a fruit juice concentrate is blended. About a 75% Sauvignon Blanc, and the rest is a combination of the fruit juice and resulting in that perfect blend of low alcohol, low sugar. They'd be 20 grams per litre sugar, so much drier than Moscato's. Okay. But a little bit sweeter than our Sauvignon Blanc. So not quite a lollipop. Flavor. No, no <laughs> lollipop in there, but great introductory wines and they're really good fun. You know, if you want to have a glass of wine at lunch, you can have the Spritz Fruit Fusion range mm -hmm. and you don't take that heavy hit of alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, when do you introduce the fruit juice into it? So normally if we've got a, you want to bottle these wines and you want to make them very quickly so they're fresh and mm -hmm. bright and vibrant. Um, so if we see that we need to do a production run, we have our Sauvignon Blanc in tank and we order our fruit premix of the blood orange you blend them together, it's a process that probably takes about three weeks to blend together, stabilise, do your fine tunings, filter and then bottle. Amazing. 
I can't wait to try some of those. In terms of innovation at Banrock Station, you have really taken into account the climate in terms of growing your grapes. And you also have a lot of conservation areas here, like your wetlands and what have you. So yeah, I mean, Banrock Station's all about habitat protection, habitat restoration. Mm -hmm. So that starts here with our centre. But in terms of not drawing on the environment, we make sure our vineyard is using drip irrigation, yep. subsurface irrigation, and yeah, like you touched on, we, we try and do those varieties that don't need as much water as the traditional ones. So Montepulciano and Tariga are quite hardy varieties, so we can reduce our, our input of water. Mm -hmm. My first introduction to Banrock wines was the cask wine, which um, back when I was drinking it was uh, a recycled box that had plant seeds in it yes. that you could plant. Yeah, and I you do that. still yeah, you do still do cask wine? Very much so. <laughs> yeah, the same wine that goes into bottle will go into cask. Um, if it's a Moscato, obviously it'll have a different sort of gas CO2 level. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in terms of quality, whether it's cask or bottle, it's the same endeavour. Yeah. So the flavour is still on par? Yeah, very much so. The cask is just convenient. It's that picnic wine. Mm -hmm. You don't feel the pressure to finish the bottle. <laughs> yeah. If that is a pressure that you... Yeah, I think <laughs> everyone gets anxiety about having a half drunk bottle of wine. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> and the Riverland is where the cask was created. Yes. Yep, Dr Ango. Dr Ango. And we've come a long way since the, the first cask. Mm -hmm. I believe there was a peg on the end of it. Um, <laughs> but now we have a... a, a little a, bit more high tech. Something that can survive for up to three months. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a great option for people that just want to have one glass of wine. Mm. And so the big team here, you've been here for a long time. There's obviously some magic about working here that keeps you here. Yeah, I think the, the challenge of vintage is the number one thing mm -hmm. that you love and working with the vineyard team, working with the environmental team, but working with Amy, who's our manager, how they're gonna launch a new product, what food's gonna be in the kitchen that month. Everyone's very passionate about wine. We love talking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna do some training later today. Oh, cool. Um, I was sort of hoping to talk about how I think you engage customers mm -hmm. and, and the best way to get our message across. And so the training that you're doing will help all of the staff to understand the wine more? Or? I hope. My thoughts were just about you know, sort of relaunching the idea of showing new wine. Mm -hmm. So if, if customers come, they don't know the spritz range, so we can explain why we've done that. And we can also talk about the recent vintage and let them know what's going to be coming. Mm -hmm. Whilst filming the cellar door in the South Australian Riverland, our crew chose to stay at the Loxton Courthouse Apartments, enjoying a slice of local history and friendly hospitality. Find out more, visit loxtoncourthouseapartments.com.au today. The um, figures for visitation to the uh, Banrock Cellador in general range between 50,000 and 80,000. So quite a lot of visitors. Yeah. And we keep track of how many go for a walk. Mm -hmm. And it works out to about one in three. Oh, that's heaps. It is. It's, it's quite a good opportunity to get people who might be coming for a nice glass of Shiraz or, yep. or a cool Sauvignon Blanc yep. to come down here for, for a, a bit wander. of a wonder and, and sort of get encapsulated in what we're doing down here. Yeah, it's a lovely, you've got that sort of deck up at the cellar door and you yeah. can look over this and then you can come down and immerse yourself. Come down to the boardwalk and walk off for your lunch <laughs> and then go back and have another glass. Yeah, great. <laughs> now we're coming up to a bird hide, yes, is that right? Yes, that's right. So this is one of our five bird hides. So you. this is where you come and you count the birds. That's right. The 5,000 birds. Yeah. In a, in a good day. It's incredible. But you can sort of see out here you've got this really nice covering at the moment of that, that red colour plant mm. that's uh, one of the knotweed species. And then in the foreground you can see there's a couple little red gum saplings still, uh -huh. still coming up. Is so that, this is a bird's nest? It is a bird's nest. Do you know I've always thought that they were wasps' nests? Well, there are wasp nests that look similar. Oh, but sure. Yeah, these ones that tend to be really that sort of funnel shaped, I guess you'd say. Uh huh. See every little bit of mud that the birds brought back. And so they brought that back and built it. I little. always think nest making is one of the most amazing skills. Yeah. To, to think that if you had to make that with nothing but your mouth, yeah, or just two fingers, how yeah. long it would take you? How long does it take them? Months. Yeah. Yeah. So they take a long time to build that. 
And you have public groups coming? We do, to yeah. Look absolutely. at the birds in the morning? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And we get school groups we'll bring down and do a bit of a tour to talk about the ecology of the wetlands and the bird life. That's great. And people come and see these too sometimes, just some of the history of the site. You can see in 2011 how high the water level got through here. Was that pre boardwalk? No, the boardwalk So the boardwalk was, was just completely underwater? So this little line you see here was 2016 and it was so full that we came down with canoes and canoed all through the bird hides. Wow! Which was so much fun until we realised that there were snakes that were sort of stuck in the raft because they in couldn't the get out and you're <laughs> pushing through and trying to paddle through really quickly. Eek! And how long have you been the wetlands manager here? So I've been here for seven years now. Amazing. So slowly becoming. I'm not part of the furniture yet. I might be a leg, but I'm not yeah. the whole thing. Okay, yep. you're making your way there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've canoed through bird hides. Oh, I have. I That's a like... start. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for sharing this incredible space with us. It's great to see. And look, here's another one of those little the red little gums babies. that have managed to have come up since we started drying the wetland. So if he gets up to about this high before we um, put water back in, he'll have a happy life. Speaking of a happy life, I reckon we'll head back up and taste some more wines. Beautiful idea. Yeah. Let's do it. Great. Thanks, Tim. No worries. <laughs>
but I really like that. It's soft, easy drinking. Mm. Once again, you can serve oh, it over delicious. ice. That's delicious. That's lovely. Look at that sort of candied fruit, a little yeah, bit of spice. It's, it's a mellow sweetness. But that's what we want. We want it to be a supple, soft, easy drinking wine, mm. very low level oak. And then we lead into the final wine. Yes. Which is where I sort of chime in in terms of my favourite because it's <laughs> more of a structural wine. Yep. We do have some of those varieties in our vineyard that we talked about, sort of Petit Pedos mm -hmm. and uh, Tintamole, Tintakeo, Tariga that we can use as a spicing, complexing agent at the end. Mm -hmm. And this will see oak maturation, so it should be a more structured wine. Mm -hmm. You can see more legs on this one. We say these wines are made for immediate enjoyment, but this will age in the bottle at least for mm -hmm. two years. Mm -hmm. But the Banrock core range are all about that spice, generosity, yep. our, our climate um, facilitates that brightness and ripeness. It's got that nice oaky kind of... I really like that. I like that, yeah. sort of that vanilla spice, a bit of sort of tobacco leaf. Mm -hmm. But great to enjoy these wines sitting on the deck. Hopefully people go to our kitchen and try some local vanilla. produce. Thanks so much for having us, Paul. Thank you so much for coming. Mm. Hi, I'm here at the Renmark Club with Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Hi, George. Now, you've recently become the general manager. I have. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. No, what a beautiful club you have. It's an amazing club. Mm. Just love this place. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a great place to work. And yeah. An, so lucky now to have been given the role as general manager. Yeah, mm. looking after it. Yes. And it's a very versatile venue. Yes, it is a very versatile. Yeah. We have general dining, mm -hmm. we have a lounge bar, and we can section it off into all areas. We have a lot of weddings here. Yep. And it's a beautiful place for oh, a wedding. Amazing. Vista. Yeah, and then they usually start with their drinks and canapes on the deck mm -hmm. and then move inside. Yep. We do corporate events. Yeah. Um, we have nightclubs, we have acoustic music, mm -hmm. we have events that happen literally on the river and there's dinghy racing, there's water skiing and it's huge. Um, starts in the early afternoon and finishes late at night. Um, it's very popular. Mm. We, there are thousands of people here. Um, this year we finished it with the fireworks, but it's Beautiful. fantastic. Mm -hmm. We have New Year's Eve here. We have the venues sectioned off into different areas with DJs, music on the deck, and then we also put on a fireworks display. And you haven't gone unrecognised because the Renmark Club's won Best Club for some yes. astronomical number yes. of years. Yes, um, our staff have won awards. Our chef is Chef of the Year. Um, and your chef just got a brand new kitchen? He has got it, yes. Yes. We've just recently opened up our state-of-the-art kitchen. Amazing. Yeah, it's it's brilliant. We can do up to about a thousand meals now. Oh, wow. A day. And, yeah. and would, you, would you get that busy? Yes, in the summertime we do. Incredible. Yes, yes we do. Where? On the Murray? On the banks of the mighty the Murray banks. River. Oh, yes. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> you practice that. <laughs> and we've yeah. got a little island yes, behind us. Yes, there is an island behind us, mm -hmm. yes. Um, and around us, we have all kinds of great things. Yes, uh, Renmark is, uh, well, the Riverland is a great mm -hmm. um, wine region. Yes. Lots of wineries, some fabulous wineries in Renmark. Mm -hmm. um, we have caravan parks, we have Beautiful. hotels. Fabulous eating places in Renmark and the whole Riverland. Mm. It's just, yeah, the produce is really. Oh, the pr yep. produce is fabulous mm. here. Citrus, mm -hmm. uh, it's a great region. And the what's your favourite spot to visit around here when you're oh. not running the club? Well, I live in Barmer, so I actually love the lake. And you know, Barmer is quite close to. Yes, it's about half an hour away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Renmark is about two and a half hours from Adelaide and an hour and a half from Mildura. So it's quite. <laughs> centrally located mm -hmm. and all the towns in the Riverland, there's Loxton, Berry, Barmer, Wakery, they're all very close for visitors to go to. Mm -hmm. So 
If you stay in one town, you can easily visit all the other towns in the region. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few little bakeries and yes, things sort of yes, spotted around. Yes, there's lo lots of little places. So I noted the coffee bakeries. Coffee shops. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a fabulous region. Bring a boat up. Houseboats. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come up here for houseboat holidays. Pull up alongside the deck and I literally pull up out the front. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, that sounds fabulous. Yeah, it's a great place to holiday. Mm. So we actually do a lot of destination weddings here. Oh, sure. Yeah, so it's a great place to come. And, and you have accommodation. Yes, we it's have across the road. Across from here? the road. Mm. Yes, we have um, the holiday apartments across the road. Mm -hmm. Um, you got the whole deal. Everything. Right. <laughs> the gem of the Riverland. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Come to Remma. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Thanks, Lynn. <Lynn's. laughs>I'm Sally Stanton and welcome to the Celador. Today I am in the stunning Hunter Valley, famous for their Shiraz and Semillons. But today I'm visiting Mount Air Vineyards, who are working on something a little fresh, a little innovative and very, very special. You're the viticulturalist here at Mount Air, and without you, these vines would not be here, would they? You actually planted them back in the 70s. That's right. In fact, these very vines here I planted in the 70s, and... Um, Your babies. That's right, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and then we proceeded in planting Semillon. The sandy soils are well suited to Semillon and, and Chardonnay in the right. area. Um, and then in the late 90s, um, we sold the property and Nello has introduced us to a variety called Fiano. It's mm -hmm. a southern, being Italian, a southern Italian variety and it, the Fiano has done very well here. Um, so to the extent where I see Mick Williams are actually planting some themselves. So right. yeah, it's, it's just a new variety. And I think that's something that the small boutique um, vineyard owners can do yeah. rather than big companies. They can experiment. Yeah and put small batches out to the public, yeah. um, so yes. And you have been involved for, it's nearly 50 years now. Yes, unfortunately, and, and I don't know where all those years are gone. <laughs> but, uh, so you um, said, you know, you've seen a lot of ups and downs. What are, what are some, maybe lows that have stuck out for you? Well, back in, back in the, the late 80s, we had a hailstorm here. So yeah, we lost our whole crop. Yeah. Um, it was a battle, but we got yeah. through it. Wow. Um, we've had a couple of uh, floods here, because this yeah. is all um, Monkey Place Creek, floodplain. Right. Uh, beautiful soil but yep. it can flood yeah. further over there. And I suppose now um, it's quite opposite with the drought. Oh well, yes, we're heading into our third year of drought right. um, but we've had uh, three um, very good years mm. um, quality wise. Yeah. So, um, Semillon and Chardonnay do exceptionally well here in the Broke area right. um, because of the lighter sandy soils. Okay. And what about some of the highs? Well I guess having a good vintage, putting yep. all that work yep. into it, a big effort and um, and, and seeing the end result yeah, uh, yeah. Of, of wine that people enjoy. Agnello, thank you for having me in this beautiful part of the world. It's beautiful. Your family owns Mount Air Vineyards. How did it all come about for you? Well, we've just done 20 vintages, so we're very pleased at, as to our history and mm. how things have developed so well for us. Uh, started back in 1999. My wife and I used to drive through the Hunter Valley almost on a weekly basis mm. between Coonabarabra and Sydney to visit our relatives and we always used to think how beautiful it is around here. <sighs> Next thing you know we own a property in Broke and a property in Picolban with our in-laws. <laughs> It's been a great history ever since. Yeah. And where did your love affair with wine start? Well, like most Italian children, we used to see our fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers and mums too, helping them out, making wine in the backyard and same with Greek families as mm -hmm. well. And I guess that planted a seed somewhere deep in our hearts or yeah. our minds and eventually that's blossomed and turned into this wine business. Now I have to ask, you're a doctor, and I have realised there's, you know, a bit of a, a link between people who work in the medical yeah. practitioner, yeah. as medical practitioners, and wine. So many people are involved. Yeah, it's quite common in Australia. Yes, why? Well, 
I'm asked that question a lot, mm. especially when I'm overseas. It doesn't seem to happen as much overseas. Mm -hmm. But the way I think of it is in medicine, you have to stick to the rules. You have to be very focused, very disciplined. Mm. Not a lot of scope for creativity, mm. but being human beings, doctors are human beings too, of course. We need to have some sort of artistic outlet, some sort of creative outlet. Right. And for some of us that comes through as winemaking. For others, they may paint, they may make pots, they may do photography. We make wine. Of course, wine making is also science and art yes. together. Yes, it's, so a, it's a good blend of both. That's why you excel. Michael, you are the winemaker here at Mount Air, but how did you get into the wine business? About 20 years ago, I used to work in uh, the food and beverage industry mm -hmm. um, as an engineer, and I tinkered with different processes, and one of those was uh, brewing, yep. uh, or part of the brewing process, and I got a, got a liking for different beverages, mm -hmm. and I, I, rather than beer, I, I prefer to drink wine, so um, I started trying to make my own wines in my laundry at home. Really? Yes. Wow. Um, and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that <laughs> they were awful. So I thought, oh. I've got to do this seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've got, to, I've got to get the wow. right equipment and whatever. So, uh, so it kind of started as a hobby for you? Yep, very much so. And then a complete career change? Yes. Wow, that's great. And how did you find yourself here at Mount Air? I moved up to the Hunter mm. um, uh, with, with our young family and had a job at, a, at another winery. And um, decided to branch out to do our own label. Yeah. And, and then uh, five years ago, uh, came in contact with Mount Air, and yeah. um, here I am as a winemaker for Mount Air. Well, you're a man in demand, aren't you? A great winemaker. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, most people know that, you know, you're using liquids to make a delicious beverage, but what do some of your day to day activities involve? There is no day to day activity. Yeah. Every day is going to be different. Yep. And right now, we're, we're just at the, the end of our harvest essentially right. um, so we, every day has been crushing grapes uh, fermenting grapes yep. moving them from one tank to another mm -hmm. to barrels yep. keeping an eye on the ferments as mm -hmm. they're progressing along so that they don't get too hot don't don't stop yep. losing a lot of sleep while doing that it's a busy time for you <laughs> it is very busy but thankfully that's now coming to a, a bit of an end mm -hmm. so for the rest of the year yeah. it will be a, a matter of getting those wines settled down, um, cl clarified, yep. ready to bottle, and then go on holidays. So I you wish. do get, oh no, <laughs> I was going to say, is there, a, is there a lot of downtime? No, there's not. There's not, um, okay, so you're uh, always making. Yes, mm. th there's always a wine coming to the point where it needs something yeah. done to it. Um, yeah. So it's a, it's a full-time job for the, for the whole year. What is the Mount Air philosophy? Our philosophy is really about authenticity, mm. about place, about terroir, as they say in French. Mm -hmm. We're a small company. Our wines are very much tied to the location. Unlike a lot of other companies who draw in grapes from other places, our wines are what you see. Mm -hmm. We grow the grapes, we get them made, we keep a close eye on the vinification process mm -hmm. and the packaging process. So what's in the bottle is controlled very rigorously mm -hmm. and it's very much tied to where you are now. Some other companies as they get bigger have to relax that philosophy, lose a bit of authenticity. We like to think of our wines as very authentic and very rooted in location. And you have two vineyards, don't you? We have two vineyards, yes. The first vineyard we um, bought was in Broke mm -hmm. back in 1999 and as you already know, you've met Neil Grosser who's been working those vineyards for a long, long time. Mm. We've even named a wine after him to pay tribute to all of his great work. He's been really one of the pioneers of the Hunter Valley, mm. one of the silent achievers. I guess that's another philosophy for us. We're just silent achievers. Mm. We don't create a lot of fanfare. Yeah. We just go about making the best wines we can. You don't need the glitz and glamour to make a good wine. Well, you need good grapes and you yeah. need good people to make yeah. good wine. We've made the choice over the years that, uh, to keep this property very exclusive, mm -hmm. very private, very secluded. Mm -hmm. 
And rather than run a restaurant or a cellar door, as many houses have become, mm. we've left it as a very exclusive guest house mm. where you can be in the heart of Bacolburn, a short drive away from all the major attractions, yeah. yet very private. Yes, I'm feeling very special right now. And the other thing is about staying here, which is very special, is it's an operational vineyard. So you could be staying here and see Neil at work. You could see mm. harvesting. You could see pruning. Depends what time of year you're here. Mm -hmm. Help so, out uh, with crushing the grapes. Well, well <laughs> we, I think our guests have better things to do. But certainly that's uh, something they could think about doing. Whilst filming in the Hunter Valley wine country, the Channel 31 crew chose to stay at the Longhouse. Set amongst a private 25-acre vineyard and featuring a spacious living space with stunning views, the Longhouse is a must-stay. To book your visit, go to thelonghouse.com.au today. this room, this is where a lot of it happens. What have we got in these big tanks? Uh, well, these are only little baby tanks. Oh well, yeah, actually they are. In the, in the <laughs> scheme of things, yeah. but essentially we put our whites and rosés into stainless tanks. Okay. And they don't get to see any time in wood. Mm. Uh, Most people, you know, would think, oh, wine comes from, well, goes into a barrel, but that's not true. Well, for a red, mm. um, that, that hopefully is the case. Yep. Um, why we put the white into stainless, it, it doesn't breathe, mm -hmm. so there's no oxygen ingress into the wine, so you don't get that wine, all those nice yep. fruit characters um, being lost. Mm -hmm. um, whereas reds, you want to integrate oxygen in with the, the tannins and, mm -hmm. and get them to a more palatable state right. um, after about 18 months in oak. Whereas in stainless, the, these will be hopefully done by um, May, June, July this year. So this one inside is actually a Chardonnay? That's right. And what happens? So uh, it's it's fermented in there. Yep. It's now finished fermentation. Mm -hmm. It's uh, going to be clarified okay. uh, and fined. With, what is clarified? With, uh, so basically um, it's very cloudy with um, floating mm -hmm. dead yeast cells. We want to get that out yep. and settle that down on, mm -hmm. on the floor and so that we can then pump this into another tank, filter it, and off to uh, the next stage of making the sparkling wine. All right, right. so this is part of this the Neptune part of sparkling, the, Neptune, yes. the Chardonnay part, and it's blended with Semillon. That's right. All right. And what's it like working with these new Italian varieties? It's great. Mm. Uh, it's something different as a, mm. as a winemaker, rather than you know, the traditional Semillon, Shiraz that mm. we see all the time in the Hunter, which are great as well, but Fiano in particular, I, I really enjoy working with that. It, it, it will handle a little bit of oak, it will, works really well in stainless, um, it's got lovely aromatic characters. Mm. You can change how you want to process it depending mm -hmm. on the style you, you're trying to create. You, right. you, could, you could spend a few days with it in contact with mm -hmm. the skin, or you can go straight into press and, and um, go straight to juice straight away so right. it, there's a whole spectrum of different characters that you can bring out it's my choice is it a nice change to have these new varietals yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and and um, I, I, th I think it's particularly suited to our um, climate here in mm -hmm. the hunter it's uh, it's it's very hardy and robust um, yeah it's just dead easy to work with um, from all the way through the, the process. Yeah. And the public loves it. So yeah. That's, well, that's the best part. The of it. Fiano, I found my new favourite, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> what have we got here to get started? Well, we should always start off with something that cleanses the palate. Mm -hmm. So we're starting off with our Neptune Sparkling. Now, Neptune is a blend of Semillon and Chardonnay, mm -hmm. which are the two classic Hunter varietals. It's a fraction of the price of French Champagne, and yet it's still got that beautiful uh, toastiness, that nice tartiness. It's got that ability to, to cleanse and also an ability to age. It's 
classically Hunter and classically Australian. It's not the typical Pinot Noir Chardonnay mm -hmm. blend of Champagne. Mm. So it's something that's uniquely Hunter and something that's very pleasing to drink. Cheers. Cheers. So it's light and fresh mm. and goes very well on its own. It's a good party wine to mm. toast. Mm -hmm. Also perfect with seafood. That's why we gave it the name Neptune, God, ah, of, the, God of the Sea. Of course. So you match it with oysters, prawns, nothing's better. It's delicious. I'll go for a second. <laughs> that is lovely. And what have we got next? Next, well, you met Neil and you wanted to taste the famous yes, Grosser Semillon. So let's do that. Famous Grosser Semillon. How could I not? All right. You have to be doing something right to have a wine named after you. Yes, not only do it right, but do it right for a long time. Yes, wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think Neil has shown that he's not a fly-by-nighter. He's been <laughs> doing it for a long time. Always set a very high standard in viticulture. Highly respected throughout the industry. But again, a silent achiever. So Semillon in the Hunter is a very well-known international varietal. If you talk to wine experts around the world and ask them what are the quintessentially Australian wines, the first thing they'll usually say is Hunter Semillon. Mm. The next couple of things they'll probably say would be Shiraz and Rutherglen Muscats. Mm. But Hunter Semillon is usually the first thing that comes to mind. Hunter Semillon is one of my go-tos, I've got to say. <laughs> So like all classic Hunter Semillons, no use of oak, the fruit expresses itself, it's all a really a reflection of the vineyard. The winemakers have very little to do, mm -hmm. in fact the, the less they do the better to Hunter Semillons. Yep. Yep. Clean, fresh, very approachable even though it's so young, this happens to be the 2018 mm. that we're drinking. If you let it sit, it'll change its characters totally. Mm. So if you pick up this wine in 10 or 15 years, it'll be toasty, honey-like, mm. a lot more lush. And the good thing now that we use Stelvin caps, these wines could easily age 30, 40, 50, 60 years. It's wow. the, the sky's the limit. Yeah. Uh, so there'll be no problems with deterioration yeah. like there can be with corks. Yeah, yeah. This is a classic expression of Hunter Semillon. It's one of the best ones we've made and a good tribute to Neil Grosser. Mm. Okay, thank you, Neil. <laughs> thank you, Neil, yes. <laughs> the next two wines I'd like to show you are wines that I think are, are more innovative. Mm -hmm. uh, you've asked, what is our philosophy? Mm. One of our philosophies is to do something a bit different, do something a bit more innovative. For a long time, I think Australian wine has been too focused on the standard French classic varietal Shiraz, mm -hmm. Merlot, Semillon, Chardonnay, Riesling. We thought we should bring in some new varietals into the Hunter Valley. Uh, we brought in Fiano and Nero d'Avola. Mm -hmm. um, Fiano comes from southern Italy near the Naples area mm -hmm. uh, where my father used to originally, where he came from. Others are now bringing in other Italian varietals. You can find Sangiovese, Barbera, and some of those have been around even longer than we've had the Fiano, but Fiano is definitely our baby. Yeah. And we've done very well with it. We've won a couple of trophies with our Fiano, a heap of medals, wow. and uh, good reviews all over the place. So let's see what you think. Yeah, so what am I going to be tasting here? What should I expect? Well, Fiano's oh, got a lot more body than, um, than Semillon. It's an interesting wine because it sits right in the middle of the flavour mm. profiles. So if you think about wine in terms of body, you can be light and you can be heavy. Fiano is right in the middle. Mm -hmm. Then if you think about wine in terms of dry versus sweet, again, Fiano is right in the middle. Yeah. So it's it sits on because the it's right <laughs> in the middle, it makes it very approachable for everybody. Mm. It makes it very versatile in terms of food matching. Yeah, not too heavy, See not what too you light. Think, yeah? You're right, it really does sit in the middle. Like the first thought is, hmm, not yeah. like a Sauv Blanc. No, so it's not a, like little, a, it's a little, bit, little bit heavier than a Sauv Blanc. Mm. Not as 
aromatic as a Sav Blanc, yet it's still aromatic. Yes. But not as heavy as a Chardonnay. Yeah, I think this will be liked by a lot mm. of people. Not as light as a Semillon. <laughs> so really good general purpose. So in this, yeah, this is particular good. Fiano, you can see elements of citrus fruit. Some say mm. lemons, some say mm. mandarin. Isn't it funny, people find different things oh. in the wine. Excellent. But there's also some herbal notes. Mm. So whether you want to call it cut grass or hay, but not too much. But not too yeah. much, yes, yes, because That's sometimes delicious. it can be too herbal. But what I wanted to show you today is Nero d'Avola, because mm -hmm. it's the only one in the Hunter. It comes from Sicily, although it may have ancient Greek origins. Once you go back 2,000 years, it's very hard to know what's what. Yeah. So uh, Avola is a town in, in southeastern mm -hmm. Sicily, and it's got this grape called Nero Davola, which is black, so black grape from Avola, that's mm -hmm. what it means. A lot of people say Diavola, which means devil, but it's actually Davola, so ah. very, very subtle difference. More like a dove. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this is a, a full-bodied wine. Mm -hmm. um, it's becoming really popular around the world. The wine writers are all into Nero Davola now. Mm -hmm. Not many producers in Australia, but it's starting to change. Is this a spicy one? See what you think. And I think, all yeah. right. I'm one of those people who tends to say something completely out of nowhere. No, no, you've got to say what you think. You've got to okay. say what's in your mouth and in your nose. Let's see. So it's got body, but maybe not quite as much as Shiraz, mm -hmm. but it's definitely got spice there. A lot of dark berries, a bit of chocolate. That's what I'm smelling, dark berries. So maybe dark Ooh, cherry, chocolatey, smooth, chocolatey, very smooth. A lot of spice. Mm. Lasts, lasts on the palate for quite a while as mm. well. But not as, I hope you agree, not as heavy as a cab or a Shiraz. A Shiraz, no, not at all. So the beauty of that mm. is you've still got a great flavour profile, mm. but because it's not quite as heavy, to match it with food becomes a lot simpler. Mm. So you don't need to have that very heavy fatty lamb or beef. Yeah. That, that a big Shiraz or a yeah, big Cabernet Shiraz, really, yeah. really needs. Yeah. So here you can contemplate a more subtle thing like game meat, mm. bread pasta sauces, um, vegetable soups. Mm -hmm. So you can do a lot of things. But likewise, if you wanted to have it with a cheese or a chocolate, you could still do it. Yeah, a pre-meal drink. Yeah, a pre-meal red, too. I would say. And, in, <laughs> and in a hot, hot, on a hot day like Today, you could even put it in the fridge for half an hour and it wouldn't do it any harm at all. chilled red. Mm. Lovely. Yeah. And so this is another Italian. And you know, these are kind of the millennial wines, aren't they? Innovative. The, the millennials really love these sorts of wines. Yes. They love to find something different, something yeah. with a story. Yeah. And we think we've got a story to tell. Oh, I definitely love these stories. Cheers. Cheers. It has been so lovely meeting the people behind the wines here at Mount Air Vineyards and it's so nice to see a small boutique winery, family run and passionate, doing so well in the Hunter Valley. And with the release of their new varietals, their future is looking bright. Over the course of making the cellar door, we've had the pleasure of travelling Australia, visiting all our country's beautiful wine regions. Many of those regions and the communities that surround them have been greatly affected by the bushfires, and Channel 31 would like to extend our support to those communities affected. If you have the capacity to donate, visit redcross.org.au or wildlifevictoria.org.au to support their ongoing relief efforts.